let me say that I would like to place our discussions in this session, and for that matter, for our whole two days, in a broader context of development over the long run. What I would like to stress is the fact that, in many ways, uh, what we are looking for now is a change in the paradigm of development. If I look at modern development, say over the past three centuries, you can say that the first phase after the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century was a phase where basically the driving force of growth was supply expansion, increased supply. That was what the great technological developments of that time did. Uh, to give you a simple figure, if you take, for instance, steel production in Western Europe and United States where the Industrial Revolution took place, uh, steel production doesn't really start significantly till the mid-19th century. Between mid-19th century and early 20th century, it went up by a factor of 40. A 40-fold increase in steel production, which means a 40-fold increase in the extraction of the minerals required for steel production. And you can multiply this example in many other ways. But the 19th century growth was driven by the search for new technologies to expand greatly the availability of goods and services. And uh, much of this involved a very intensive exploitation of material, the material resources of, 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 of nature. Uh, the second phase of the 20th century, on the other hand, was driven by an expansion of demand, the democratization of demand. And one simple number to illustrate this. At the beginning of the 20th century, in the world as a whole, there were 25,000 cars. At the end of the 20th century, there were 600 million cars. It was a ph phenomenal expansion in consumption of material intensive goods, whether it took the form of energy, whether it took the form of materials or, 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 or whatever. And these were in some ways the char characterized by the way corporates were driven also. Corporates in the 19th century were corporates were looking for ways of expanding supply, looking for uh, resources, capturing resources, getting concessions, and so on. Corporates in the 20th century were driven by the search for markets, for new products, for expanding their market presence, for winning market share against competitors. In the 19th century, they were winning, trying to get resources vis-a-vis -vis competitors. In the 20th, they were trying to get markets vis-a-vis -vis competitors. And this has been the characteristic of the corporate culture of, if you like, policy of the driving forces of growth and development over these two centuries. What I want to argue is that the driving force of development in the 21st century will be, in fact, will have to be resource management and conservation. That if in the 19th century we thought in terms of using more resources to expand supply, if in the 20th century this resource use increased greatly because of the drive for expansion of demand, typified by the number that I gave you for uh, automobiles, I believe that the driving force of growth and development in our century is going to be a drive for resource efficiency, resource conservation. And uh, what we will look to at the end of the century, a comparison that we will seek, or the sort of comparison I made in what motor cars or steel production, the comparison that we people will make is what was your material productivity at the beginning of the century and what is it after? What was your carbon productivity when we started? What is your carbon productivity now? What we have to aim at, for instance, in the case of carbon, if you want to halve carbon emissions by 2050, is not a 5%, 10%, 100% increase in productivity, but a 1,000% increase in carbon productivity. So I wanted to stress that today when we talk of material security in this century, it's not just a matter of ensuring supply, of ensuring that you have this available. Today we have to understand that material security in our century is going to be as much 
about conserving that resource and finding sources for it and looking for it. There's a second dimension I want to stress. We have tended to look at material security more in terms of security of supply, availability, etc., even more efficient use of this. I would stress a second dimension which is becoming equally important is to look at this in terms of the impact that that material use has on the ecosystem. I've, I've, co I've come to you from Delhi. Delhi has 1,500 motor cars coming in every day. To me, the material security issue of that in Delhi is not where am I going to get the oil for these cars. The real issue is what am I going to do with the pollution that these cars are going to emit into the atmosphere, which is choking us. That is my material security problem in Delhi, not finding the oil for it. And increasingly, you will see this in other areas. Our problem in energy today is not finding sources of energy, but minimizing the impact of energy use on what it is doing to climate and other things. In area after area, as I'm sure one of our speakers is going to tell you, we are reaching not just local and national limits, we are reaching global limits. And therefore, today, in this century, we will have to think of these issues of security, not just in terms of availability, not even in terms of just the efficiency with which we use that resource, but the impact of that resource use on the rest of the ecosystem. And this is what I would like to stress when we look at these four questions, that what is it that we need to do in terms of changing the corporate mindset? What is it that we need to do in terms of connecting policies across silos, which will allow us to take this broader view, to focus not just on resource efficiency, but also the impact of resource use on the broader environment and the requirements of efficiency that that generates. So I would urge that we take this broader view of material security, and particularly now in India, we have launched on this great mission of Make in India, where we expect to see a huge increase in manufacturing production in this country, and therefore a huge increase in material use. I think it's particularly urgent that we address this question of how are we going to manage all this. Let me just end with a number. Recently, some geologists made a calculation of the weight of the technosphere, the weight of the stuff that we as human beings have made by way of buildings, by way of roads, by way of landfills, by way of the material objects that we have create, created for our own use. And the weight of that, they estimate, is 30 trillion tons. That works out to 4,000 tons per capita for the 7 billion people in the world. So if a fat fellow like me means he's generating about 40,000 times his own weight in terms of the weight of the technosphere on this. And there are, this is a technosphere which is not capable of recycling itself, the point which Ranjit made very forcefully. And that one of the challenges that we face is to see how we can build into this the stuff that we produce and put out, a capacity for reuse and recycling which is inherent in natural processes, in biological processes. So the, uh, my urge is to the panelists, and for that matter later, that we start answering these questions, we keep this broader perspective in mind, so that we are aware that what we have to look for is a world which is far, has, starts moving away from the global limits that it is approaching now. So let me stop here and invite the panelists to uh, comment on these questions and the broader framework.